first person to witness the resurrection of Christ. So did you know that? It wasn't one of the 12. It was Mary Magdalene. So Father, help us to shift from the distractions of the world and from our emotions now to our mind to understand what the Spirit is saying through the Word. Help us to make that shift now. And so this wasn't an accident that the first person to witness the resurrection was a woman, but it was an emblem of the new kingdom age that brought women and men together on an equal plane in regards to salvation. So prior to the advent of Christ, uh, there was a lack of equality, but the New Testament church brought that equality and dignity to women that we have today. And in the Old Testament, the civic law did bestow upon ladies more rights than other religions and pagans. But when Christ came, the Spirit wasn't just poured out upon priests, male priests, but upon women as well. I will also say, though, that there have been snippets of the New Testament kingdom age throughout the Old Testament, because it's really one story, where you look in uh, the book of Isaiah and the Judges, and you will see there were women who judged and also had the Spirit upon them and were the main leaders and prophesiers of the nation of Israel. But that was the exception. So we find that the first message Peter preached, Acts chapter, 17, chapter 2, gives us a snippet of that. I don't want to read the whole message. It's a great, great teaching. But he basically brought out the fact that in the last days, God said he was going to pour out his spirit on all flesh, meaning not just Jews, but Gentiles, not just men, but women, not just older people, but children, uh, not just priests and kings, but everybody. And that's why he says, all flesh, your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream. Even upon my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. And so this is a new age. This is a new dawn. And even uh, developing nations and nations, actually not even developing nations, but nations that have not yet embraced Christianity are mistreating women. And women are not only second, but third or fourth class citizens in many Muslim nations and nations ruled by Hindi and Hindu uh, gods. Uh, there's actually a practice in India called Satri, where a woman will burn herself alive next to the body of her dead husband so that she could go with her husband when he dies. So this is an example of the amazing way Christianity is broken through and every nation that has embraced Christianity, uh, the Protestant nations of Western Europe, the Orthodox nations of Eastern Europe, the uh, Roman Catholic nations such as uh, Spain and Italy and Portugal and others, uh, especially those in Latin America, all of those nations have seen a liberation of how women are treated. It's not an accident, it's because of the power of the New Testament and the way Jesus came to equalize all humanity in the image of God. So what we want to do is highlight one of these heroes of the faith, Mary Magdalene. Mary was a person whom the Lord delivered from demonic oppression. Now for some reason there was a rumor that she was a prostitute. Um, and I think the reason why we have that rumor is because people are so ignorant of the times that they think if someone had a demon, they must have been a prostitute or something. Uh, we don't know what her background was exactly. That could have been the case. But we do know that she was delivered from demonic oppression. Let's go to Luke chapter 8. And we find in verse 1 in the ESV version, Jesus went through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. 
and the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. The first one was Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Then he mentions other women that followed Jesus and provided for them, meaning these women were the ones who supported Jesus in his missionary troop on their journey. Uh, they provided for them out of their means. So there's a little uh, shout out for tithes and offerings. Some people say, well, if God wants to do it, he'll provide. Well, even when Jesus was proclaiming the gospel, he needed people to support him. Amen. Chew on that one. So if you don't invest and you don't give your tithes and offerings, you're going to hurt the work of God. You're hurting it. So even Jesus depended on people to follow him and support him. She was so moved by the Lord that she followed him as part of a band of ladies who supported Jesus' ministry. So perhaps the story can be told like this. After she was uh, delivered from these demons, she started following Jesus. And she must have had some kind of wealth because she was one of those who supported Jesus out of her means. And so she started following him after these demons were cast out of him. And many scholars believe that she is one of the women noted in the Gospels who washed Jesus' feet with her tears. There is another Mary, the sister of Martha, who is the other one that we see in John chapter 12, verse 1 to 8, where Judas Iscariot complained that she was putting very expensive ointment on the feet of Jesus, and he said, well, this could be used to feed the poor. All these hyper-religious hypocrites talk like that, right? And, uh, uh, and meanwhile, the one who complained about using that to minister to Jesus was the one putting his hand in the offering bucket. He was the treasurer stealing the money. So a lot of people complain about the money or, them, or themselves complaining because they're greedy and want it for themselves. The people who complain about tithes and offerings and giving to the church, they're probably some of the most greediest people on the earth. I'd like to see what they do to help other people. Probably not much. <laughs> Forgive me, I just speak directly, you know me. So many scholars believe that she was the other one, as I said, who washed the feet of Jesus. We find the other one, Mary, the sister of Martha, John 12. But we believe she is most likely the one, the woman in Luke chapter 7, verse 37 to 50. And the reason why I believe that is because her name was mentioned in the context of the story. As we find in chapter 8, verse 1 to 3, she was the only Mary mentioned in the context of that story. And let's just read that for a minute. It says in Luke 7, verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of oil, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with his, her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. It doesn't mean necessarily that She's sleeping with men and all this. It just means that she has ceased kissing my You did not anoint my head with oil. You anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who can even forgive sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And then after.
but we do know that she's connected to that Mary somehow or some way because of how she lingered at the tomb. And let's look at this. This is such a powerful story. This is the part I wanted to focus on the most. Let's go to John chapter 20. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. That's John the Apostle. And said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first and stooping to look in. He saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon came following him and went in and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which was on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping. So the disciples went back to their homes. <coughs> but Mary, but Mary, I want that to sink down, stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. She didn't go by what those disciples said, that he wasn't there. And listen to this. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away. Tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So notice, while the other disciples had a quick look, then left, Mary stayed lingering, searching, Longing, hungry to see Jesus. Notice that God did not reveal Jesus to the other disciples. And he revealed it to Mary. I don't believe he revealed himself to Mary because she was a woman. I believe he revealed himself to Mary because she longed for him the most. God Lord, casual inquirers. He desires people to seek, to worship. Jesus said, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. He said, blessed are the hungry, for they shall be filled. And so today, even in this meeting, there are some of you who are hungry and some who are not. The hungrier you are for God today, the more you will be filled yes. by the Spirit. That's just the law. It's like the law of gravity. God is attracted to hunger. God is attracted to seeking. God is not attracted to just quick, perfunctory prayers. God is attracted to those who love him, who want him, who desire him. He loves everybody. You can still go to heaven if you say quick prayers. But the knowledge... The presence and the depth of God is reserved for those who treasure Him the most, who want Him. And so we need as a church to go from being quiet, casual inquirers to those who long and thirst 
And it looks like her heart was liquid when she was weeping. The deepest expression of worship is not singing with your words, but it's tears. Sometimes the worship is so profound and deep, all you could do is weep in expression. It's the same thing with joy. Sometimes you cry because of joy. Your heart gets liquid. It can't express with words. It's beyond words. And that's what happened with her. She was liquid. She was weeping. But then she saw two angels. Now notice one was standing on either side. We find it in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. It says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. She was called a sinner. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God, listen to this, God put forth Jesus as the mercy seat. That's the original in the Greek. Propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Scholars believe metaphorically the angels on either side we're showing that she stepped into the most holy where the Ark of the Covenant had the blood and the two cherubim looking down at the blood on the Day of Atonement. They were in between where the body of Jesus lay. She stepped right into the most holy place through her weeping and longing. It tells us in Hebrews 10, 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the by a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is to say, his flesh. See that? The curtain, his flesh, it's where his body lay. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and a full sense of faith. And so, as Mary stepped into that holy place, in between the two angels, and met Jesus, She's an example, post-resurrection example of how we should live in that most holy place. And then it says in this narrative that she thought he was the gardener. She, when Jesus said, whom you seek, and she turned around and she, she said, where have you laid him? She thought he was the gardener. That is also a prophetic pointer, a very powerful metaphor showing that Jesus as the last Adam came to restore things back to the kingdom shown in the Garden of Eden. So we see that Jesus was beginning the renewal of the earth by looking like a gardener. Not an accident. That longing and seeking, connected to the most holy place, connected to the Garden of Eden, shows how we're going to renew and restore the earth. He taught us in Luke 11, he said to pray this way. And one of the parts of the prayer was to pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth. And the first that we are called to do to renew all things is to be people of prayer coming to the holy, most holy place. The transfiguration of the earth come through the presence of God that is exhibited and brought down through those who are seekers and weepers and longers of God. They're the only ones who join the earth. And so today, let's examine ourselves. Are we casually seeking him? Is he just a part of our life? Is he just an important part of our life? Do we have other gods before him that compete with him? Compete with our affections that are distractions? He can't just be an important part. He has to. Christ, who is our life. And I believe that as I was preparing to, today that God wants this month to be a, a month where he begins to change our hearts. And that our hearts go from stone to being soft, 
to them being liquid. So that in his hand, he can shape us and mold us and bring us into a place where there's a residue of prayer in our life. That communing with God and knowing God and hungering for God becomes the greatest part of our life and our aspiration. And so what we're going to do is we're going to worship the Lord. And let's ask ourselves the questions as the worship team is getting ready. Do you long to seek and know God like Mary or are you too busy for God? Do you desire to linger in the presence of God like Mary or are you always in a rush to move on? Do you want to experience God or just know about God? And last but not least, do you want to be a witness of the risen Jesus to your friends and family the way Mary was? Or do you want to just keep this good news to yourself, this advertising? Very profound statement Jesus made. He said, to whom was forgiven much? They loved much. To the extent that you are grateful to God for what he's done on the cross, to that extent will you love, appreciate, and long for him. We also need a revelation of the depth of our sinfulness, to know the depth of the love of the cross, of the grace of God. And those of us who know how deep our sins go, how hopeless we are, know that this Jesus is the only hope, but not only the only hope, the only Savior who has already saved us, which should provoke us to love and worship him more than all else. So let's all stand and we're going to begin to worship him the way Mary worshipped him. <laughs>